Welcome to one of our final sessions. We've got a couple more sessions to go, uh, winding up the final day of the Writers' Festival. Before we start, I want to recognise that the festival today and throughout the weekend is taking place on Aranda land and extend my gratitude for the capacity for us to meet and share stories from so many places uh, on this land and the generosity the custodians show for holding this space and for holding the space for so many people every day. And in that paying respect to all Aranda people who may be here today and to all First Nations people and to the leaders and ancestors, past, present and future. Just a small bit of housekeeping. Um, can you please turn your phones to aeroplane mode or off? I'm going to do the same because there's nothing worse than being mid-interview and having your phone go off. Um, my name is Kelly Lee Hickey. Uh, this is Charles, Charles Massey. Uh, I'm not Glenn Morrison. Glenn Morrison is sick. Um, and so I'm going to do my very best at filling in for him today. Um, but we are in the more than capable hands of Charles Massey. Um, so I would like to welcome you, Charles. And can, we, can people hear that bird sound? Yeah. Um, we're here today to talk about Charles' book, Call of the Reed Warbler. So Charles is a radical farmer, scientist and author exploring transformative and regenerative agriculture and the vital connection between our soil and health. Massey always uses personal experience as a touchstone from unknowing chemical using farmer with dead soil to a radical ecologist farmer carefully regenerating a 2,000 hectare property to a state of natural health. In evocative stories of innovative farmers, he interweaves his own local landscape, its seasons and biological richness to create a moving and often lyrical story, a powerful and moving story of hope. This is the book, Call of the Reed Wobbler. Charles, this is, this is the bird that we can hear, isn't it? Yeah, it was playing a minute ago. Um, yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm, as a writer, I'm a great believer in metaphor, and um, so the title came out of uh, one of the stories in the book where a friend of mine had actually had been a leading economist, bought a little farm out of Canberra, and asked me to go out and see what he was doing. And uh, so we drove over some country out to his farm where he had a creek that he was regenerating, and the neighbour was um, uh, basically overgrazing and turning his country into dirt and it was eroded and there was salt. And, but the contrast with this friend of mine was quite stark. The, um, the creek he was using, if you've heard of Peter Andrews and natural sequence farming, he was using some of that stuff. Someone's clapping at the back. Um, so when we drove over the hill, is this bare country on the left of the neighbour and here's my friend's country with, uh, rather than a dry creek, the creek was running and there was green, and uh, there's a few patches of reeds, uh, Phragmites reeds, that some water bird must have brought in. And while we were talking and looking at this totally different landscape to the neighbour, uh, this reed warbler started to call out of the reeds. They're very secretive birds, but it's a distinctive call. And it really hit me because it was only a small patch the size of this stage, and there was none others in the valley. It was probably the first time in 150 plus years since that country had been overgrazed and destroyed that reeds had come back and a reed warbler with it. And um, uh, it really sort of impacted me. And I, I thought, what a metaphor of the potential of regeneration that we can restore landscapes back to semblance of health. So that's, that's where it came from. And, and um, it was nice to hear the call. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. And are you going to read from the call of the reed warbler this, this incredible uh, book on regenerative agriculture that's started a lot of conversations in a lot of places. Um, so you're going to read for us a little bit now. Well, it's just after lunch, probably put everyone to sleep. I'll, I'll read a couple of pages because it does relate um, to why Australian landscapes have really uh, disintegrated with the wrong management so quickly. 
It was late summer at the end of a day's shearing as I was following a mob of Sean Merino hoggets, that's one-year-old sheep, up a lane from the shearing shed when I was reminded of how powerful and fundamental the processes are within natural systems. <clears throat> at the top of the lane in an adjoining paddock of mixed bush, there are a couple of lovely candle barks surrounded by blackthorns and native grasses. <clears throat> As I passed these, mooching along behind the sheep with my dogs, I suddenly heard an awful scream coming from the vicinity of a candle bark. I had heard rabbits screaming when caught, but this was different, a piercing sound of sheer terror by some poor creature. I climbed the fence to investigate, but then stopped. Two metres in front of me was a three-quarter sized rabbit in the entrance to a burrow but around it were three coils of a large brown snake whose head rested on the rabbit as it gazed at me with those dark, glittering and implacable eyes that send a thrill through one's backbone. Clearly, the snake was waiting for its venom to take effect while the rabbit continued screaming. I left prey and predator alone and as I walked back to my dogs and sheep, the words of Tennyson sprang instantly to mind that nature was red in tooth and claw. However, as I continued slowly following the sheep, I thought about the incident. Yes, Australia had its share of fierce predators, yet this jungle law, or what Herbert Spencer in the 19th century coined the survival of the fittest, this jungle law wasn't the only mechanism operating down under. In fact, for life on Earth in general, and the process of evolution in particular, collaborative symbiosis and forms of mutualisms are fundamentally integral mechanisms. In their seminal book, Microcosmos, Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan powerfully reveal that, quote, in contrast to the usual view of neo-Darwinian evolution as an unmitigated conflict in which only the strong survive, Evolution is as much symbiotic and interactive. There is, they concluded, a very thin line between evolutionary competition and cooperation. So I'll leave it there. The point I was um, trying to make was uh, the white settlers that came out here from early 19th century came from really what was a young landscape, post-glacial uh, northwestern Europe, rich soils, probably only 10,000 years old, full of nutrients, very humid atmosphere, soft rain. And so they'd evolved techniques for that farming and they came to Australia and applied those techniques in a land that was totally different. Two thirds of Australia is up to 3.8 billion years old, so there's, in technical terms, there's bugger all nutrients left in them. Um, very dry, quite brittle landscapes, and underneath the landscape there's this burden of salt. So if you overclear the wrong country, you get dry land salinity. And so that's, what hap that's what's happened. In, in, an, in some cases, less than a century, um, these ancient landscapes were destroyed very, very quickly through that wrong mindset occurring. And that, so, so with things like phosphorus in Australian soils, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, you can put big dollops on it if you're farming. Australian ecology under the ground, and above the ground for that matter, is used to, to using very small amounts of things like phosphorus, and so that it's recycled very quickly in a dog-eat-dog dog thing. If you put a, an industrial dose of phosphorus on, you kill that whole collaborative microbial world underneath, and that's the point I was trying to make. We are totally different, but the wrong mindset arrived here, and um, the regenerative agriculture movement is starting to look at Australia now through Australian eyes and those of us working with indigenous people like I do with a senior lawman at home, that's really helping that longer term view of how sensitive our landscape is. Thanks Charles and I do want to pick up just a little later in our conversation about what happens when we start to witness these changes, the impact of what we've done here. But first, in your book, you talk about um, this mindset that we brought here as the mechanical mind, and you, you contrast that in the early stages of the book with the emerging mind. Can you tell a little bit of us a little bit about this mechanical mind, where it came from, and 
and how it interacts with this emerging mind. Actually, it was the organic mind. Sorry. The organic mind, with, yep. the emerging mind slide, yeah. And, and it wasn't my original work. There's a, a marvellous environmental historian, um, Caroline Merchant, wrote a book called The Death of Nature, where she analyses this, and it's been done. If you look at um, most indigenous, well, not most, all indigenous nations across the world, and, and even a medieval peasant, um, they didn't see themselves, and they don't see themselves as separate from Mother Nature. Um, they see themselves as quite indivisible. They have religious cycles, belief systems, uh, and, and this country of ours with its multiple nations and their extraordinary approach to country emphasises that. And even the medieval peasant that Bruegel might have painted in the 1500s still had their harvest festivals and they didn't see themselves as separate. And then what happened in the West, we went through that extraordinary phase post the Renaissance, and, and quite wonderful, a lot of it. The scientific revolution, which led to the industrial revolution, the capitalist revolution, and then today we have the uh, modern capitalist or economic rationalism. Um, the process of that shift over three or four centuries was we no longer saw ourselves as indivisible with Mother Earth, but separate which meant that Earth now became this substrate from which we extract profit. And that's really what under, underpins the way Western agriculture, at least, if not all of the modern Western societies uh, approach it. And that's a huge shift. Mm. And um, I'm not saying we, we go back in our farming to the past, but I argue towards the end of the book that we need the best of both worlds if we're going to continue feeding and regenerate landscapes. Mm. And so thinking about this, you know, when you start to unpack um, this, this history of both separation and that we've come into someone else's land and imposed a system that is not only devastating to country but to people, how do you deal with that failure, not only of witnessing it within the land but actually an existential failure of seeing what we've done here and the impacts of it? And what can regenerative agriculture teach us more broadly about how to, how to respond to this failure and a path forward? It'll take a book to answer that question. Um, I guess um, I'll answer it one way. In getting to know the, uh, the Indigenous senior lawman friend of mine, uh, he took the scales off my eyes and allowed me to see what the country was like 1820s when white settlers came into our area, which is southern New South Wales tablelands. And he has a story back that passed on to him that in the 1860s, his great-grandfather, we've got a dry lake at home that's ephemeral, every now and then it gets water. And he said it was nearly permanent water then. And his great-grandfather speared a jabiru stalk on that lake in the 1860s. Uh, it was covered in magpie geese. A big flocks of blue and yellow budgerigar and brolga. And you won't see that now except up in northern Australia. And it's the same further north in some of the lakes. So what happened with the early settlers coming in with their overgrazing of sheep and then the plough, um, it destroyed the, the small water cycle which keeps land dehydrated, uh, hydrated and soft. And that slowly eroded and was destroyed and all the beautiful spongy grasslands destroyed and and uh, those of us managing today aren't aware of that until, unless you get a, a, a good historical record or that sort of cultural memory. And um, that's impacted me a lot. I, I don't think what we've done with our destruction with incised creeks, we've destroyed that small water cycle and destroyed a lot of our grasslands and forests. I'm not saying we can ever get back to exactly what it was in 1788, but understanding what it was like and, and uh, what I'm now seeing in regenerative farming we can at least get our landscape functions working a lot mm. better and move back towards that goal. So it's sort of mm. a goal out there, but um, I don't know if that answers your questions, but that's sort of what's behind, I think. Yeah, it's a big question. I don't know if it's possible to yeah. ever answer that one in any short time. Um, with that idea of, you know, we can't, we can't get back there, but we can start to, to move towards something else. This is something that you that you also talk about in the book, you know, there is the organic mind and the mechanical mind and you, you say, you know, this isn't about an about turn. 
This isn't that we can't go back to the past. But what you talk about the emergent mind as blending the mechanical, the best of the mechanical mind and the organic mind. What are these qualities that they blend and how does this manifest in regenerative agriculture? Another really good question. <coughs> what, what led to the book was um, my mistakes as a farmer. So I went through a five year, uh, first of all I went off to university, mad keen on zoology and, and uh, animal behaviour and so I did zoology. And also Australia's first course in holistic thinking at Australian National University. And then I had to come home at the age of 22 and run the farm. My father had a heart attack. And uh, I didn't know anything about management, so I sought the best advice and really became a good, in, if you like, traditional industrial manager. We walked into a five-year drought in the uh, late 70s. And I did great damage to our landscape. Um, ended up with a big debt, had to sell some country. And, and that's what triggered my journey um, towards seeing if there was a better way. And it just coincided with this movement in America, Australia and Africa towards regenerating landscapes on the broad scale. Uh, we've known about the organic movement and Rudolf Steiner, biodynamics and those sort of things, but we now have tools that mimic uh, African herds in regenerating grasslands and, and there's now some wonderful cropping tools that don't do the damage like the others. And so it was that journey that um, got me examining this other ecological way of farming. And I guess it was that that, um, and going back to university uh, about 40 years later, because of my concern about what was happening, um, I, had to, I had to catch up on four decades, if you like, of extraordinary work since the mid-70s when I'd left as an undergraduate. You know, we'd had the computer age and systems thinking and the World Wide Web and all that. And out of that came a pretty good understanding of ecological systems and other systems, what are called complex adaptive systems, which if you want to dig into it, have about uh, 12 components. And I had to get my head around it to teach master's students. There was a couple of traits in them that really hit me um, and one of them is the capacity of natural systems, if enabled, if, if we allow them to start functioning in a better fashion again, they will self-organise themselves to a state of health using properties that within the system that are called emergent properties. And that really impacted me. That's, and it started to explain why over broad landscape, landscapes across the world in three or four continents we were seeing this regeneration of grasslands and soils. And so towards the end of the book, when I, I talk about regenerating the key landscape functions and the problem with the mechanical mind which had destroyed the Australian landscapes and, and also the American, the Dust Bowl and all that. And then I thought about the, the organic mind. How the, the, I noticed that the, the leading farmers that were and the leading writers like Wendell Berry and and others who are really the sort of modern fathers of regenerative thinking, um, that they were combining that sort of organic mind of an indigenous mind that Mother Earth came first with the scientific knowledge. And so I'm not saying that the mechanical mind should be ditched. We need the best of modern science, but we need to marry it with that empathy and that clear philosophical view that it's the health of the ecosystems is prime. And from that comes healthy foods, healthy fibre, healthy water, the whole, whole thing. And um, grappling with that idea out of self-organisation and complex systems, I sort of, for the time being, labelled it that new mind as sort of an emergent mind. Mm. Yeah. And so, as, as part of your PhD, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you was part of your PhD where you travelled and you spoke to over 80 farmers mm. around the world um, who were blending up this, you know, this organic mind and this mechanical mind and with this emergent uh, mind and this idea that we call regenerative agriculture. Can you tell us about what you learnt from uh, talking to those farmers and a bit more broadly about what is this thing where we're talking about regenerative agriculture and, and why can it help us so much? 
Well, the first thing was I had a, a scholarship to do a PhD, which was permission to visit 80 of the best farmers in Australia doing this work, and subsequently overseas. And so I did... Um, I wasn't looking at what they were doing, but why they'd changed. So it was more social research. And when I analysed the interviews, uh, the key question was why had you done this paradigm shift? Because it is a total worldview paradigm shift to go from industrial agriculture like I'd been doing to one where you think totally different about the landscape. And what I found was, uh, and this was corroborated by one other bit of research in America in, um, in the field of education and learning, was that in 60% of those cases, it had been a major life shock that had cracked their mind open to open that paradigm up. Mm. Um, one, person, one of the leaders had been burnt in a bushfire. Um, quite a few of them said the big droughts were headcrackers. Uh, a number of them had been poisoned by chemical accidents. Those sorts of shocks had made them sit back and say there has to be a better way. And uh, the other 40% were sort of, they were either, all that, either that way inclined or, or there'd been this destabilisation process towards it. So, so that was the process, and I forget the other part of your... What is regenerative agriculture? Oh, regenerative agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about here? Yeah. <laughs> yep. it, if you go back to basics, our, our landscapes, you can really kind of um, describe them as having four major functions, uh, the way they work. There's obviously the solar energy system drives the whole lot, so plants fix sugars, grabbing carbon dioxide, and that feeds the soil biology or grows the plants. And then you have a, a water cycle, uh, the soil mineral cycle and biodiversity. And I've added the, the fifth one, uh, which is the human social, that problematic square, as one farmer said, that square foot of real estate between our ears. Um, and if you look at it through that more scientific way, um, each of them is interrelated, so if you regenerate one, such as increased ground cover and, and more photosynthesis, you're going to impact all the others, uh, water cycles and all the rest. But if you, if you harm one of them, you're going to harm all the others. And so that's, um, that, that's where that, that, uh, that approach came from. So regeneration, if you look at it, it's a root word, it's a Roman word, um, that really means ongoing improvement. Um, uh, from the word regeneratus in, in Latin. And uh, where I went to university, at Australian National University in the Fenner School of Environment and Society, every, every second paragraph has the word sustainable in it. It came out of the United Nations process of sustainable development. But it was so overused and it, it started to get the feel to me that it, it, it could mean just marking time, just holding where you are. Whereas regeneration uh, incorporates that concept of self-organisation, it's, it's an open-ended possibility of ever-going improvement. And that's why I think it's so powerful. And it's now, not because of me, it's, it's a word that's now replacing sustainability in the, uh, in the re regeneration field. Mm -hmm. And it also, if you go back to the, root world, word, to the root of the word, it has sort of ethical, moral connotations tacked to it. So, mm -hmm. And I think... Our treatment of landscapes, um, for better or for worse, has big ethical moral implications tied to it. That's, you know, only have the whole of our indigenous cultures are, are saturated in that um, caring for country. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, if you don't, and, and we haven't had that because of that mechanical mind. And mm. if we're now going to turn around our destabilised earth systems, and we can talk about that later because regenerative agriculture has some of the most wonderful solutions. We have to have this mind shift and with that has to go this ethical, moral um, uh, approach to country and land and systems. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, and as we were talking this morning, that, that need for a story shift and, and the role of hope um, in the storytelling. So, and I think that hope is something that, you know, sometimes it can be really, really hard to visualise. So, can you tell us a bit about 
what's happened on the land that you live on and that place that you're connected to in terms of regenerative agriculture over the past few years? Where have you come from and what's it like now and where are you going on this journey? We're lucky. We've now got about 23% of our farm back to its original native vegetation status and um, the grasslands on our basalt country through uh, what you call ecological grazing, which is a, a human management with large mobs of animals that replicates what's happening in the African herds, which, which tends to stimulate really healthy grasslands. I won't go into the details. So our basalt country is regenerating really well. It's, it's treeless country. And so we're seeing, starting to see species emerging that no one's seen for 100 years because as the soil gets healthier, the bugs bring up buried seed and that sort of stuff. Our problem area has been our granite country, which was overcleared, eaten out by rabbits and ploughed, mm. which was pretty typical for a lot of uh, Eastern Australian tablelands and slopes. Um, and so because of that, it's got no what you'd call biological function in it. There's, there's not enough insects and birds and cover uh, to control pests, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we've recently planted, or well, recently, in the last five years, 50,000 mixed native trees and shrubs that uh, a lot of them are local seed that I've collected. And we're now getting function. And one example would be until the uh, mid-'80s, my father told me that uh, from when he took over management in the late 20s, that every five, six years, we'd be wiped out by wingless grasshoppers, <coughs> an instant drought. And once we got ground cover up through better grazing and got these trees, shrubs and bushes going, we haven't had a wingless grasshopper attack because the nematodes, the spiders, the birds, the insects, the parasitic wasps uh, have controlled that. So that's, that's one small example, but it's, it's worth, if you're managing a farm, it's worth a, an enormous amount of, of dollars, if you want to put it crudely, because um, we're not being wiped out, our production base isn't being wiped out. And that's... That's only one small example of what um, I'm now seeing in four continents. Mm. Maybe it's time to explain that the big grazing revolution, uh, and it's really livestock that have destroyed many of the great grasslands uh, in the settled, the, the continents like America and South America, and parts of Africa and Australia that were settled by Europeans. And this uh, ecologist in Zimbabwe uh, was working with animals and he noticed, um, well he asked a question, how can, in those days there were still millions of animals in the big mig migratory herds. And he said, how come that's the healthiest grasslands he's ever witnessed? Anyway, after a long process of 15, 20 years, he evolved a system that tries to replicate that with human management. So where you get animals, instead of 20 small lots of animals that sit on ground and just chew out your valuable grasses. You, you put them in a large mob, create that density and dung. Um, in the African herds, they're constantly moving because of the packs of predators pushing it. In our case now, it's humans that move them. And this has become a very sophisticated planning process. And the results I've seen in um, Africa, North America uh, and Australia and, and seeing the results in, in photos in Mexico and South America are absolutely astounding. Uh, it, that method now is regenerating extraordinary grasslands and, and farmers are now in many places running more than three times the stock they were before in a vastly diverse, healthy landscape. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's actually just, it's that old principle that the top ecologists work about, that nature has had a fair bit of practice over millions of years of evolving healthy systems. We've simplified them. If we now create the conditions to let her get on with what she's good at, uh, you will get regeneration, and that's what's happening. And, and in the last, I'd say, the last 10 years, we now have three major methods of growing industrial crops using animals in the system that are now doing the same stimulation, which means we're eliminating all industrial inputs, chemicals, fertiliser, etc and getting extraordinary regeneration. And, and that, that's to do with some modern biological knowledge we're finding. But um, that's why I'm so bullish about, um, to use a bad term, I suppose, I'm so optimistic um, that even some of our biggest issues to do with climate, et cetera, 
this regeneration of both broad and small landscapes is, is ex has extraordinary potential. That brings um that brings me to the next point I want to make is you know talking about um that you know a paradigm is such a strong thing and it requires a really significant shock um, to create that change and you know the late great Deborah Bird Rose she talked about that the possibility. Uh, of the Anthropocene is that it can actually provide a big enough crack in modernity for something else to happen. Now, you know, in terms of um, the climate change and, and the broader ecological crisis that we're facing, what is the role of regenerative agriculture in, in changing this? And, and are you starting to see that paradigm shift in, in agriculture more broadly in the people that you're working with? That's a really good question, and I'm glad you've mentioned Deborah Bird Rose because when she was, she wrote a wonderful article about uh, the, the indigenous concept of country, and uh, one of her phrases was, uh, "It's a nourishing terrain," which I think is a lovely description. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing lots of workshops now, as are people like me around Australia and talking in the States and Europe uh, as this thing starts to get traction. And so the workshops, a lot of us are running. Um, five years ago, we'd be getting 20 people and a couple of cattle dogs at the back of the room. Now we're getting 150, 200. There's, there's a real shift on. And I think, uh, despite some of the scepticism, I think things like climates, um, uh, disruption, I call it, rather than change. Mm. Um, but if you go into a, a, a room full of um, farmers, and as one friend of mine said, farmers usually have good crap detectors. So uh, if you just go and talk in climate, the shutters will come down because it just reinforces a bit of scepticism. But if you explain to them that, uh, and I usually show photos to illustrate it, when you show them the, the, that photo that was taken by Apollo 13 or whichever one it was of that blue planet sitting out in that dark space, then say, well, this is the only one that we know of in the universe. It's blue-green, which means it's got life. And, and it was actually life that created conditions for life. Like about 3.2 billion years ago, it was bacteria that broke open water and put oxygen up for the first time. And then once... Uh, algae and lichens and that crawled out of the sea, started to break down rocks and we got soil and the great forests got going, the carbon dioxide cycle began to regulate, etc. So we now got to the stage in the last many millions of years where this extraordinary planet, this blue-green planet, is sustained by nine interrelated systems to self-organise that thin envelope around that protects us from the harmful rays and doesn't get too hot. And out of those nine systems, climate is but one, and they're all interrelated. You've got the water cycle and biodiversity and land systems and phosphorus nitrogen cycles and so on. When you explain that to farmers and, and show them that interrelated nature and its sensitivity, uh, it, it starts to get rid of that knee-jerk paradigm issue. And uh, I've been privileged in the last um, few years to get to know a, a, a person called Paul Hawken, some of you would be aware that in the last three or four decades he's been a leading writer and thinker in the social and environmental area. He's written books like um, Ecology of Commerce, Blessed Unrest, etc. Mm. And about 15 years ago he, he asked the climate scientists, OK, we've got this problem, what do we do about it? And, um, and I know, some of them are friends of mine at ANU, some of the leaders. And they said, well, we don't know, we're focused on the chemistry. And so he commissioned 70 uh, leading scientists and technical people to come up with the 100 best methods of pulling down carbon dioxide or preventing it going up, and, and they fully costed 80. Uh, Penguin put the book out about 15 months ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely production. And, and when you go through it, there's about seven or eight regenerative agriculture methods like agroforestry and, and grazing, etc. And I said to him, they're all doing the same thing. Let's just call them Regen Act. And when you do that, we've discovered that if you look at the numbers, regenerative agriculture by nearly two and a half times the next best method is number one addressing climate change. 
and from that flows the other thing. So that's, if, if we can get this um, revolution going, um, it has huge potential and, and only last, no, two weeks ago I was doing workshops in Gippsland and uh, the land care people lined me up with a farmer who's just been awarded the first carbon contract under the Paris Agreement with the United Nations. It's the first and only contract because of what he's doing with his new cropping approach. And he's fixing just under 1% of carbon a year through healthy biology and regenerative ag. And uh, the best results prior to that, you know, in the best environments would be five years. So uh, I am optimistic we can grow this revolution, we can address some of those really big issues. And um, what's behind that is that we, it looks like now after that wonderful sort of last 12,000 years of stability for planet Earth, what's called the Holocene, that, that beautiful period of uh, correct carbon dioxide and temperature, et cetera, et cetera, that was why agriculture evolved and because of that, um, the first civilizations evolved. But because of that, this so-called intelligent ape has now got ourselves into the situation where now we're destabilizing that system. And that's why there's a pretty good consensus amongst scientists around the world that we've now moved out of that last 12,000 year Holocene period into what they're calling the Anthropocene, anthropo-human caused. And maybe I'm, uh, I'm naive, but I think if we can cause it, perhaps um, this so-called intelligent species can um, pull it back to safe limits. Yeah, with, with, any, with any luck. Yeah. Um, just before I go to our last question here, I just want you to let you know that we will be opening uh, up the floor for questions. Um, I, I know that a few people have, do have questions here, so I just really ask you to, you know, consider, think clearly about how you could ask uh, that question as a concise thing. Um, a, a sentence or two is always enough and I know it can be tricky to decipher between questions and comments but one of the biggest clues is you'll notice that with a question your voice will go up at the end whereas with a comment it's usually like pretty deadpan flat keeps going. <laughs> Charles, um, just to finish up our discussion, you know, you talk about humans being one of those, you know, critical features in the ecosystem and the role of regenerative agriculture, you know, the potential of it to really help us move through these, you know, very, very challenging times that we're facing. For those of us who aren't farmers, how do we get involved? What can we learn from this way of viewing the world and support what's actually happening out there in the land? No, it's a great question. Um, we're not going to be able to turn this thing around and regenerate it without the support of the majority of Australians which, who live in urban areas. So... It's a fairly simple equation. If it, the healthier we get our soils, the healthier is the food. And uh, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the precious microorganisms in the ground when, in, when you get a really healthy food are your root fungus, what are called your microhousal fungi. In a healthy soil, quite simply, is just full of biology. And you start spraying it, ploughing it, you destroy that. In a healthy cubic metre of soil, um, these, these fungi have micro-feeding tubes and you can't see them except with a microscope. But in a healthy cubic metre of soil, there may be 25,000 kilometres of these tubes working away mm. and the fungus have a partnership with the plants. The plants, when they release root sugars, that's the food for the fungi and, that, and their role is to go out, their part of the bargain is to go and source nutrients. Huge range of nutrients, micronutrients, minerals, phytochemicals, that comes back into the plants into our food. And that, that's truly healthy organic food. If we go spraying Roundup, glyphosate, um, over fertilising, we're killing off that biology. And so you've got your industrial crops sort of waiting for their drug fix of nitrogen and phosphorus from the, uh, the industrial fertiliser. And that, that really sums up the um, the modern health issues, we now know that glyphosate's into our food, disturbing our guts, and we're, we're, we're eating food that's pretty much empty of all those huge range of nutrients that we've co-evolved for over a million years for our health and our immune function and our physiological function. So what I'm leading to is uh, 
this partnership of us regenerating landscapes, healthy food and fibre, it's only going to work uh, with that supply chain going into the urban areas. And, uh, and uh, we need um, both the support of um, the sort of health, organic healthy food movement, but you know the, the growing of the green belts and farmers markets and market gardens and all uh, um, urban gardens, etc. So it's, it's, a, it's a dual thing. I'll just make one, one other comment um, before we throw out the questions, and we touched on it in the previous session, but I'm just thinking of that extraordinary, um, the more I work with this senior lawman and coming out into this country and learning about the different countries and, and nations, and that organic, extraordinary organic worldview that's evolved over probably 60,000 years that our indigenous people have with country where they don't see themselves as separate. And there's a lot of emerging science that just shows you how we are totally indivisible from nature. Um, we now know that w and when we trigger the really critical conditions in the soil, you get to a tipping point, what the microbiologists are now calling quorum sensing, where you suddenly get plants communicating with the bugs in the soil through chemistry. Um, that if they're short of nitrogen, the, the, the bacteria will start fixing it, or if they've got a disease, they get in the attack bacteria to wipe it out. And they're switching each other's genes on and off, what's called epigenetics. If we eat food off that healthy soil, the bugs in our gut are switching our genes on and off. So if you think about that, whether it's across phyla, families, genuses, species, we are all communicating with each other through chemistry. And uh, and now the latest research that sort of reinforces that uh, through uh, medical researchers in the States working on things like autism because of the disturbance of our microbiome through bad chemical is that uh, not only are, are our genes being switched on through the, the messengers are, are also uh, microRNA particles, but we are incorporating that microRNA in our guts. Um, and it looks like we're about 15% bacterial microRNA, about 15% fungal, and certainly virus components. If you go for a walk in the in a forest where the plants have been breathing microparticles, you're imbibing some of that microRNA. We're incorporating it into our own genome. Think that through. We are an indivisible part of nature, and uh, so that mechanical mind just shows you how ludicrous it is that we think we're separate. So. That, that new sort of knowledge is really, um, I found very impactful and uh, very, um, um, forces great humility, yeah. really. Yeah. And, and is incredibly reassuring. Yeah, it, that too. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, I'm going to throw it out to questions. We do have a roving mic. Questions? Thought I'd get away with it there. <laughs> Charles, you're, um, by writing this book and putting these ideas out here, you're becoming the pointy end of the evangelical move for change in this area. How are you um, dealing with that? And how's your farm going while you're away out here? <laughs> well, we're currently in drought and one of the... Um one of the tools we've got with uh, this new ecological grazing is we have very precise grazing charts that assesses ground cover, food, quality of the food, number of animals, and we usually, through those sort of tools, have two or three month warning on a season declining. And so uh, the land, the, the switch in my management has been from looking at land as an economic thing to the land comes first. So we've been selling down now for eight months, so we're about a third stock. So I'm answering the first part of your question. Um, I've, I've got enough help and family to run the farm um, in my absence. Talking about change, I mean, there's an old saying that the only people who like change are babies with wet nappies. Um, and that's pretty right. Um, when you're changing paradigms, it's unbelievably challenging because It is, and, and sometimes that's, there's benefits in conservatism, but um, I think 
those of us running workshops uh, and, and, and we're, we're talking in, in, um, in across into America and Europe as well and vice versa. There's a terrific collaboration across continents now. Uh, we're all noticing in the last five, eight years uh, a huge rise in attendance of farmers. That, they know these things are wrong. The American cropping scene is totally trapped by the industrial system, the crop insurance program that forces them to buy GM seed and the right chemicals and stuff and, and they're still going broke. And um, in Australia, too many droughts and, and cropping systems hitting the wall with too many chemicals and this hard pan that's now developing across our lands. Uh, that, those head cracking events are incurring more, occurring more and more. So the workshops are now moving from 20 odd people up to 150s, 200s now. So um, uh, the wet nappy syndrome is coming in, I think. In many ways it is, but also a lot better knowledge and understanding and, and some wonderful exemplars out there that people can go and look at or read about, which is why I wrote the book. I mean, I'm not the pioneer of the regenerative stuff. There's some wonderful lateral thinkers out there and, you know, we're, um, as we said earlier, the, there's no accident that uh, literary festivals are popular. We're, we're a species made for story and metaphor. And if you can tell, which is what I've tried to do in that book, stories about wonderful things happening and it, it's, it's, it also helps that process once the head's been cracked a bit. Um, we've got one here and one and down the back um, as well and yep we'll just go to here and then we'll go down the back and then we'll come up the front if we've got um, time. Charles, um, when you look at our country and you look at the wide vastness of say outback New South Wales, outback Queensland, it appears to be the multinationals, the giant conglomerations, the, the aggregation of smaller farms into much larger farms and that are managed by, not by the heart, but by the pocket and the wallet. You've just m mentioned recently that um, you've moved from an economic model and you speak about the farmers that come and, and listen to you. How do you teach the traditional farmers to change their markers of success? You, you're quite right about the uh, conglomeration. Um, and that's the industrial model we're up against, uh, which takes no account of ecology uh, or health of any sort, you know, except the balance sheet health. Uh, and that's why I really refer to this whole process that I'm playing on the idea of healthy soil, which drives it as an underground revolution. I, I really see these re regenerative farmers and the ecologists supporting it, etc., as sort of insurgents driving change. Um, that we're, 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 yes, we're landed with those structural problems. And um, one of the fathers of regenerative agriculture is a wonderful poet and writer called Wendell Berry, and he writes so well about the loss of that agrarian culture of smaller farms, uh, not quite self-sufficient, but uh, interacting with their community and diversity and stuff. And, and that's the industrial model, which is get big, economic rationalism, um, and what economic ecologists would call, we don't use the full resource accounting models. In other words, you only look at uh, the mechanical aspects and forget about that landscape and ecology is actually should be p part of that, those calculations, which would, which would be full resource accounting. I think um, what's happening is as this regenerative model gets going, as well as ecological diversity, and I've seen many great landscape operations are now producing two and three times more productivity with less costs because of the ecological health. It's quite astounding. And the other thing they're doing, the principle is diversity, diversity, diversity in healthy ecosystems. So they're now increasing enterprises um, <coughs> whether it's chooks, chooks and pigs coming into a grazing system or various forms of agroforestry and food forestry and stuff. So the next generations now suddenly, instead of being pushed out, are now finding they've got a, a role to play as, as farmers stacking on, in some cases, six or seven more enterprises. So the, the whole resilience, 
It's the old ecological principle of diversity. It's, that's going to be slow, but um, the, the, the broken model is the industrial one and, and, and it's what's done the harm and, and hopefully that will eventually fail and, and the aggregation to be re-broken. Yeah. Good question. Uh, the lady down the back in the sunglasses. There's, every, but there's several ladies down the back in sunglasses, but we've got <laughs> you in the end. <laughs> Oh, hi, Charles. Uh, my question's about buffalo grass. In Northern Territory, there's quite an extensive problem with um, the exotic grass. It's sort of like just walking along the Todd River, there's extensive areas of it. And um, I live in South Australia and it's sort of moved down there. So it's heading south with the changing climate conditions. And in terms of regenerative agriculture, I was wondering how you sort of foresee controlling or addressing that sort of issue where you've got farmers that need sort of that as a perennial crop feed, but then it's not really in the best interest of the ecosystem to have it. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert in this environment. I, I'll, I'll make a preliminary okay. comment and then I'll throw the football. Um, usually an invasive weed of any sort, so-called weed, is, is trying to fill a hole in a destabilised ecosystem, whether it's a, a forb punching a hole or an invasive grass because the, the soil nutrients have gone. But we've got one of Australia's leading desert ecologists in this room, Steve Morden. I don't know whether you'd like to handle that, Steve, or you leave it as it is. I, I certainly am not going to pretend I, I can speak with authority on that. Uh, no, you're sure <laughs> Okay. So I'm sorry, I'm not going uh, I, to... It'd be arrogant of me to even try and address that when I don't understand your country, I'm sorry. Um, we have a question at the front as well. Um, also just want to uh, put a call out. Um, any women or First Nations people in the room, please. Um, we've got, I uh, know this gentleman in the front with his, um, with the, his, please, you know, pop your hand up. We've got room for probably one more question after this and just want to make sure that those of us who don't always get to speak get heard. Okay. Uh, thanks, Charles. Um, I suppose my question was around, um, I mean, we obviously have a dominant paradigm of kind of what I suppose you might call factory farming, um, and um, and that's that obviously seems to meet a, a short. It's a short-term solution to a long-term problem. Being we've got, uh, and I think perhaps to an extent, the elephant in the room is overpopulation and um, and trying to feed an increasing global population in the most, the, the quickest and most efficient, efficient way possible, um, which is clearly a very short-term perspective. But can, do you think regenerative farming, that there could be that kind of revolution rapidly enough to be able to continue um, feeding a growing population um, in, you know, in the environment in which we live? That's a really good question. <coughs> And it's one that I hear frequently and, and talking to some of the leading analysts. Uh, the, uh, recently, the uh, United Nations FAO released a study on food production globally. And over 70% of the world's food comes off five acres farms and less by peasant farmers, majority of whom are women, uh, who, who also don't necessarily own the land. Uh, if you increase that to 10 acres, it's probably 75% plus food. Um, you then analyse we're wasting upwards of 30% of the food that is produced and you wouldn't want to eat a lot of the industrial foods the other side. It's the potential of unused land, and I'm not talking about clearing forests, but wasteland that can be regenerated or peri-urban country. Um, the, the analysts that I've read and studied, that they're confident we could feed 11 billion if we had to. The, the fact that we need... that The fact that... Uh, what's behind that question that you would have heard is really the big industrial end of town trying to say you need, we need their chemicals and fertilisers to do this. Well, we don't. Uh, we can do it a lot better and we can do it ecologically um, is, is what's emerging. Uh, just to the back, just over here, uh, the lady in the striped shirt on the right-hand side, sort of three quarters, two thirds of the way down. Okay, got you. Hi, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned the full resource accounting. 
under the two versions, more traditional sort of financial accounting and under full resource accounting, how is your farming enterprise faring under the are they the, under the benefits of regener regenerative agriculture? Well, first of all, um, we find we're, we're running more livestock because we've regenerated the system sustaining them, but uh, we're far more resilient um, towards dry times and we don't get those insect plagues, uh, the grasshopper plagues, etc. So um, I try not to look at that one-dimensional economic model, um, but if you include that, um, our resilience has gone up because of we now have a more of a full, if you like, resource ac uh, accounting approach to farming. Is that? Yeah. Uh, Kieran, and then the gentleman behind her, and then that'll be us for questions today. It's coming. Um, I just wanted to ask you about political blockages. Um, are there any that are very significant or can um, farmers and community response drive this? Yeah, good question, especially in view of last night. Um, well, if you think about it, um, and we mentioned this at the last session, most societies have a great story they tell themselves, um, whether it's indigenous societies about an earth mother or whatever. Our society has this suicidal economic rationalist story which drives us. Growth for the sake of growth. Um, so our governments, the big multinationals from food processing right through, our government departments, by and large, our university institutions, our education institutions, teaching, industrial ag, the whole thing. The whole power structure is industrially oriented. So regenerative agriculture is a really, that's why I call it an underground insurgency. We are undermining that whole false edifice because it's time we, we told ourselves a new story which is about regenerating earth and that's why our indigenous people are, who put country first so importantly and, and the, our, the relationships with it is such something we've got to take on board because at the moment we're the opposite. And um, uh, so I expect no leadership from the top down. I, that's not how change will occur. They might follow, but I don't give a damn. It's, it's, it's us and the urban consumers after healthy food and, and those other issues that's going to drive change. That's, that's my, my belief. And um, even though I'm at one of, it's still attached to one of the leading um, environmental institutions in, a, in a, an Australian university, they're a bit short of money and so they're making bargains with the industrial end of town for high-tech approach to farming and stuff when, you know, we should be going to the appropriate ecological approaches. Uh, I actually, um, yeah, very quickly, just if it's a fast question, we've got just a couple of minutes back, the gentleman just here. Um, yeah. Thank you, Coming. Do you, do you want to use the, yep. When you're working with small, medium-sized landholders across Australia, a lot of, if you're asking them to make changes, um, there's risk involved, and I'm, I'm, you know, they're making decisions about what to grow and where yep. to put the energies and so forth. And as you know, how do, how do you, how have you found that take up of the willingness to make innovative risks in this? New way. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not so much asking them to make changes. I'm, I'm just saying, uh, and people, are, uh, the increasing numbers at these workshops is because people are, are worried and destabilised. So really, it'd be arrogant of me to say there's a right and a wrong because there isn't. It's, it's each farm is unique. Its landscape's unique. But these are the basic principles. And here's an alternative. If you want to go that way, you can eliminate your chemicals and you can get these other ecological benefits. Um, and I don't know how many workshops I've done now and speeches, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens, and the people that turn up are there because, that, uh, and it's, uh, quite often it's land care that's driving, those sort of CMA land care groups, and usually young to middle-aged women are often the drivers too because the women tend to be more empathic about some of these issues, not like us mechanical males so much. 
Uh, so it's not so much talking down and saying, well, here's an option if you want it. Um, it's an evolving space, but it's, it is exciting and it's related to health. So, and I'm, I'm making the assumption they're there because they want to be. And some of the workshops now, we then have follow-up days where uh, probably half the audience might turn up for how do we make a transition. So it's, 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 it's a gentle discourse uh, which they can take or leave if you like. And occasionally um, you get some anger because it is a threatening of paradigms. Does that address where you're concerned? Yeah. Charles Massey, unfortunately we are out of time. Thank you so much uh, for joining us here in Alice Springs uh, and for all that you've shared across the two sessions today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together uh, for Charles Massey. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks so much.